Another arose, whoops, I hit the wrong button. If I hit it again, oh good, it's an involution. Uh, so another arose in work of Einz Siedler, Linda Strauss, Michelle, and Venkatesh from about a decade ago. Uh, another is a very old uh, problem in numerical integration, another old problem in pseudorandom numbers, and uh, about 30-year-old problem uh, in modular representations um, called Lustig's conjecture, and a problem in continued fractions called Zaremba's conjecture. So we're going to be bouncing around uh, lots of different topics. And uh, so here are six problems that I'll try to explain um, what they are. And actually, the six are already interconnected. So Zaremba's conjecture um, was invented in order to solve these two problems, uh, at least the numerical integration problem, which later uh, Pretty quickly, people uh, realized it had this application to pseudorandom numbers. And more recently, um, in joint work with uh, Jordy Williamson and uh, Peter McNamara, we connected Zaremba's problem to Lustig's conjecture. OK, so the thin group's picture is that uh, actually all of these six problems are one and the same. At least we can formulate uh, a particular. So this is joint work with, with Jean Bergen. We'll formulate a local global conjecture in thin orbits, which will have all of these six, or if you like, three uh, big problems as um, consequence. Now, we can't solve this conjecture, so that doesn't help you. But actually, even partial progress can uh, have some consequences. So McMullen's problem, as I'll try to explain, is just too hard. You need the full force, as far as we can tell, of this conjecture to s settle uh, arithmetic chaos. But already a few years ago, we gave a density version of Zaremba's problem. And uh, more recently, we uh, were able to answer this ELMV question. OK. Sorry, are the labels on, there on the implications or whether things on the right are known? Like solved if you mean that you've established that conjecture or that you established So this problem was solved using ideas from this conjecture. Uh, a density version of this problem was solved. I'll explain all of this. This is just the overview of, of what's going to happen. And I'll explain this problem, and I'll give some hint about why, if we knew this conjecture, it would imply this problem. But even knowing the link, we still can't say very much at all about, about this problem. OK. And under the hood of all of this is this picture, which we've seen too many times, so I won't talk about. But um, the same principles of thin orbits and stuff that go into studying that problem will, are, are underlying this, although you won't see that picture again. OK? Any questions? I mean, I haven't said anything. So, so OK, so, so let me try to say something about, uh, I, I liked your, your uh, lecture the other day. I'm going to talk about things I know nothing about. So let me tell you about Lustig's conjecture. Um, so this is the modular Lustig's conjecture. So this is in the early 80s, late 70s. People are just starting to realize that maybe you can classify all finite simple groups. And one of the, uh, you know, the key groups to study are the PSLN over, let's say, a finite field or extensions thereof. And usually, what people care about are the representations into complex vector spaces. Uh, but why not ask about general uh, representations? So one class of, of uh, representations are modular representations. So what, what about, what are the irreducible representations of SLN FP in uh, vector spaces over Z mod LZ for a prime L? So that's a, still an, an unsolved problem. And when L is equal to P, it's even uh, sometimes, in some cases, it's more difficult. In some cases, it's easier. So this is a conjecture that Lustig made in equal characteristics. So we'll, we're looking for irreducible representations of SLN FP over vector spaces of characteristic P. And here's the conjecture. Uh, I can barely define the things on either side of it, but it's an equality. So these are some. Uh, uh, Kajdan Lustig polynomials at special values, and there's a character table. It basically explains what happens. And Lustig's conjecture is that whatever this identity is, it's supposed to hold as soon as the characteristic is large enough relative to the Coxeter number of your under. This is a general conjecture. I'm just stating it for SLN. Okay, so it really SL, uh, so the Coxeter number of SLN is n minus one. But um, that's that's the conjecture. As soon as the prime is sufficiently large relative to your initial starting data. This should kick in. And by the way, this looks very much like the complex representations. So that's kind of the discovery is that in equal characteristic, it should look like uh, the complex representation. 
And um, the question becomes, OK, how large is large enough? So the conjecture is that uh, as soon as the prime is above the uh, Coxeter number, this stabiliz the stabilization kicks in. And so what's known? Um, up to SL5, the conjecture is totally true. So except for the primes 2, 3, and possibly 5, that identity holds. Um, that's been verified. And in fact, the full conjecture has been proved uh, by the mid-90s. Many papers, many people as a major uh, industry. And um, they don't give a bound on p, how large the prime has to be. They just say, as long as the prime is sufficiently large relative to the initial data, uh, the conjecture is correct. But if you actually go through um, the proofs, uh, you can, with much effort, work out what the dependence is of the prime on the Coxeter number, and it's super exponential, whereas it's believed to be linear. Okay. And then a couple of years ago came a, a huge shock. So Jordy Williamson constructed uh, counterexamples to this uh, conjecture with exponentially uh, large, with pri for primes that are exponentially large in the uh, data in the Coxeter number under a slight assumption that there are infinitely many Fibonacci primes. So um, maybe that's not a slight assumption. We would love to know that there are infinitely many Fibonacci primes. Uh, we do believe that there are infinitely many Fibonacci primes, unlike Fermat primes. But anyway, so there was a conditional result. And uh, what uh, Peter McNamara, Jordi, and I uh, were able to do is remove this. We did not prove that there are infinitely many Fibonacci primes, of course. Uh, there's a way to circumvent that, and, and that's uh, through thin orbits. So maybe at the end I'll have time to say something about this. But So that's one little vignette, little story. Any questions before we move on to something completely unrelated, seemingly? So, so the, the shift conjecture is what? So the conjecture as stated is correct in that for primes large enough, but I don't know how seriously he, you know, this this was believed to be accurate. I mean, this was a real shock. But he did say, you know, that once the prime is larger than the Coxeter number, something like that, or linear maybe. So what's so, the conjecture as stated with this quantification is false in a very strong sense. Uh, the conjecture as stated here, just once the prime is large enough with a hand wave, is, is correct and, and solved. For small, for small n? No. Uh, All. So for small n, it's true even with this condition. Yeah. For all n, it's true with no dependence on just for p sufficiently large relative to n. And if you work out what that dependence is in the proofs, it's, it's gigantic. And it turns out there's good reason it's gigantic because it's false. For linear, even polynomial, it's false. OK. OK, so that was Lustig's conjecture. <laughs> this, the, these are different. We'll go into different topics and then come out to see the big picture. Okay. It's Prezi. Yeah. OK, it's some software. Yeah. It's free. Peter, I'll show you how to use it after. OK. Uh, the next topic is the linear congruential method um, for pseudorandom number generation. So if someone woke you up in the middle of the night and said, make me a pseudorandom number generator, probably the dumbest thing you would think of is you take a number, you multiply it by something, you add something, and you reduce mod something. Okay? That's the linear congruential, linear congruential random number generator. Why random? So pseudorandom number generator, because it's not really random. It's completely deterministic, but it behaves like a random number generator. Let's see that in action. So how random is it? Uh, for simplicity, let's uh, forget about the shift. And we may as well have the initial seed 1. Then there's some number theory that in interferes. We're looking at the graph, uh, essentially, if n goes to b to the n mod d. And so to make this period as long as possible, we should take d to be a prime and b to be a generator, which we know exists. So here's uh, one example. Let's take 10,037, make sure to. Verify that on your own that it's a prime. And 4217 is a root. And here's the picture. Okay, So you start here at 4217, and then you square it. So we're always just multiplying by n. And it's this random graph. It doesn't look periodic at all. That, that verifies that it's a root. 
And this is Fermat's little theorem. OK, so after 10,037 exponentiations, we're back to 1. So that's the only non-randomness, is where we start and where we end are fixed. Everything else looks all over the place. OK, that's why this is a good pseudo-random number generator. You have better tests than just looking at it? Give me one second. Okay. <laughs> yes. Here's, just to make sure it happens all the time, here's the same prime, but I chose a different primitive root. Here's the picture. Again, you start there and end there, and otherwise it looks random. OK, let's, exo let's go exactly to Tom's question. So they both look random. Given what does random mean uh, in, in some heuristic sense, if I tell you what b to the n is, I tell you the y-axis, and I tell you what b is, how can you tell me where on the x-axis that hits? Well, that's a discrete log problem. right? That's what crypto systems are based on. So yes, this is supposed to be uh, random from that point of view. Um, but a slightly more uh, sensitive statistical test is if you're getting these numbers one after the other after the other, you have a whole sequence. So why don't you measure, for example, the serial correlation? What if I know b to the n minus 1 and b to the n? How hard is it to guess b to the n, b to the n plus 1? Well, b to the n we know. So the point is, how hard is it to guess b to the n plus 1 given the previous two? So that's the serial correlation of pairs. And if we plot these pairs, since b to the n ranges over all, b, b, to the, b is a generator, so it's going to range over all numbers, we're just plotting x and bx mod d. Let me divide by d. Uh, I guess it is, the screen is cutting off a little bit. This is mod 1. So if you divide by d, now you're in the torus. And here's this example again. So here it is for that first pair, 10,037 and 4217. And I'm just plotting x over d. So 1 over 10,037, 2 over 10,037 against the b times x over d, mod 1. Well, no, no. This is the test of the serial correlation of pairs. And so what we want is for this to be very uniform, uncorrelated. uncorrelated. And this is an amazing, it looks just like a, a very filled in grid. But remember, the number of points we could have placed, so the mesh is 10,000 by 10,000. We could have placed 100 million points. But we're only placing 10,000 points out of those 100 million. So square root the number of points. And yet, it still looks like a fantastically equidistributed grid. Let's just make sure that happens all the time. This was the same prime, but the other root. And here's the picture. OK, so this is a horrible pseudo-random number generator. Because if I know b to the n, I have a 1 in 5 chance of picking roughly where b to the n plus 1 is going to be. OK? So that's. Um, what we couldn't see from the first picture, OK, we're still looking at pictures, but I'll, I'll give a precise uh, way to uh, encapsulate what's going on. And so this was the problem in linear congruential method. People made these kinds of pictures uh, in the 50s and said, how do we get sequences that look like this and not like that? OK, so that's the problem. You give me a modulus d. I want to find a good multiplier so that, uh, at least for the serial correlation test, we pass with flying colors. Any questions before we go on to an unrelated topic? How do you and McPherson uh, analyze the injectors as a Fourier, Fourier analysis of yeah. the random numbers? Yes. So they call those wave, wavelengths. Uh -huh. And so they measure both the uh, um, uh, distances between the, between the waves. Uh -huh. Not just for pairs, but for multiples. Right, right. And the question is, becomes, how do you choose good, good multipliers? Yeah. So OK. So, um, so that's the pseudo-random number problem. Let's talk about numerical integration. So what's the, the Monte Carlo method? I think everybody knows. You just toss a point at random to integrate. Um, what's the quasi-Monte Carlo method? So there's this beautiful inequality due to Coxman and Klafka, um, independently, essentially. There's some generalizations of it. Um, you have a function. Let's say this is multi-dimensional numerical integration. You want to integrate it over the, the torus. How do you do it numerically? You sample at a bunch of points in average. right? That's the absolute dumbest thing you could think of to do. And the inequality says, what's the difference between these two things? What's the error term? Well, there are two things that could go wrong. The function could be very highly oscillatory, 
or you could sample at a really bad set of points. And this inequality is really beautiful because it turns out that you can bound the error as a product of these two things. So the first is the, the first variation of the function, basically the first derivatives in every variable, times the discrepancy of the set of points where you sampled. So let me explain what discrepancy is. So this is really kind of, you can, uh, if the function is fixed, this, this is the whole point of numerical uh, quasi-Monte Carlo integration. You have no control over the function. It is typically whatever it is. And then what you want to do is choose points that, that maximize or minimize the discrepancy to make the error as small as possible. So what is the discrepancy? So here's a, a billion points in the torus. You take your favorite rectangle R, and you compute the proportion of points. So let's say I took D points. So how many of those points lie in R? What proportion, of, what fraction of those points lie in R? That should be very close to the area of the rectangle. And you take the difference, and you take the worst rectangle, axis parallel. So that's the discrepancy. And you can kind of see it's the geometric analog of, of this if you use indicator function. Okay. Um, and so the goal in quasi-Monte Carlo integration is you don't throw a die, as I've done here. This is just a randomly sampled set of points. You want to choose points that are minimizing, that are discrepancy minimizing. OK, so what's the, what are the benchmarks? Well, why not take a root d by root d grid? Right? It's very easy to see that the discrepancy of that will be no better than 1 over root d. In fact, maybe I can show you. Can you see over here? So here's a root d by root d grid. And here's a rectangle of area 1 over root d by 1 that has no points in it. Okay, So, that's, so, the, so you can't do better than 1 over root d in the discrepancy. All right. Why not just sample completely uniformly, as I've done in this picture, or what is classical Monte Carlo integration? Again, an exercise in the central limit theorem says the discrepancies of size root d root log log d over d, okay? roughly, again, of size root d. So as a number theorist, I should be thrilled, right? This is the Riemann about the square root cancellation. Um, th this should be very good. I'm not very happy when I compare that to a beautiful uh, lower bound due to Schmidt, that if you have any d points in the unit torus, its discrepancy is no better than some constant log d over d. So there should be an extra square root savings off of the, this is kind of the trivial square root savings. Okay, So you should be able to do almost like 1 over d in the discrepancy, up to some absolute constant. Okay, And so the problem in numerical integration is give some efficient algorithm that constructs a sequence. I mean, first of all, give an algorithm and hope, hope that it's actually very fast and, and effective to, to implement in practice to replace this root d by a log d, to save that extra square root d. The, the extra square root can be saved if Schmidt's theorem is scarce. Exactly. Exactly. It's a lower bound, not an upper bound. Wait for it. Wait for it. OK? So any other, uh, there's going to be an upper bound um, of the same quality, subject to some. The, you can. This is what arises in this inequality. You can do some kind of LP norms. Absolutely. There's, there's a big industry of but. And the lower bound is power. That's right. If you, that's right. That's right. And there are, yeah. Even if you don't take axis parallel, if you allow yourself rectangles at angles, uh, there's a whole big industry of what, what kind of inequalities you'll get. Yeah. This is just, I'm doing the absolute most baby thing in each of these uh, subjects. OK. So that was numerical integration. And all of these things are supposed to have something to do with uh, Zaremba's conjecture. So let me tell you about Zaremba's conjecture. There's a question? Yeah, it's just a little. Oh, so <laughs> it's, it's a little more zoomed in than it's supposed to be. Uh, I don't know how to, how to fix it. Um, all right, so what's the conjecture? Here, so it's coming out of left field. There exists some absolute constant, capital A. Think of A as 100 or, or 2, some, some constant. So that for any integer d, there exists a co-prime integer b 
so that if you make the fraction b over d in lowest terms, and you compute the continued fraction expansion, so these numbers are called partial quotients, a0 through ak, it's a, it's a rational number, so it is a finite continued fraction. This is Euclid, right? This is the Euclidean algorithm. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, there it is. So what's the conjecture? You can make all of these partial quotients at most 100, capital A. Okay? So again, if you look at all numbers with partial quotients bounded by 100, and you only take the denominators of all those fractions, the set of denominators should be all natural numbers. Every denominator arises as the fraction, as it, every integer arises as the denominator of a fraction whose partial quotients are bounded by 100. Right? Euclid could have understood this statement. And why should we care about such numbers? Well, it's because Zaremba proved a beautiful theorem a few years before. Suppose you have a fraction b over d with all partial quotients bounded by 100. Then, if you look at the set of points x over d, bx over d mod 1, and you compute the discrepancy of that set of d points, it's bounded by 100 log d over d. So that log d over d is the best possible lower bound from Schmidt up to the constant a, except of course the constant a isn't constant at all. It's a function of b and d. There are lots of so you don't. There are lots of other low discrepancy sequences. Why is this thing this, particular? this particular one, because it, so it's the application to both. What's that? So first of all, this gives a. So I'm lying a little bit in uh, the exact form here. Never mind. Um, the others don't have anything to do with pseudo random numbers, for example. So if you're interested in this problem of producing. Uh, best possible serial correlation of pairs, which can be measured by the discrepancy of the set of these points. So that's where it, that's where it historically came from. It depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're, trying to cons if you're just trying to solve the numerical integration problem, there's been a lot of extra work on that. If you're trying to solve the pseudorandom number problem, there's been a lot of extra work on that. But the basic uh, question that remains about the serial correlation pairs is still this discrepancy. Yes. It's no, this was in the 1950s that people were looking at such sequences. There's been a lot of work since then. I agree completely. So from the point of view of numerical integration, there are lots of other sequences that achieve this quality. From the point of view of pseudo-random numbers, you, th there's, this is the problem. If, you, if you're interested in minimizing the discrepancy of the serial correlation of pairs. I just reformulated the problem. And so let's look at these. Uh, fractions that we were looking at before. Remember the prime in the denominator was 10,037. The numerator was some 4217. So here are the partial quotients. So a equals 2 in this case. Right? So, th so that's a very low discrepancy sequence. And if we look at the other fraction, the same denominator but a different numerator, now a is 2,000, which is a fifth of 10,000. So the discrepancy, what you should really think of is, this is the wrong fraction. This 2,000 you should think of as infinity. And then it's a very low discrepancy sequence, but with a tiny denominator. And so that's what this picture over here is the, is the illustration of. Very small partial quotients and this giant 2,000 partial quotient there. It's obvious after, you know, a, a posteriori, because these are just lines with rational slopes. Well, they have to be. Um, and these are closed orbits of the geodesic flow on the torus, but some are more dense-ish than others, and that's what this is measuring. Okay, so that's measured by these, these partial quotients. Okay, so the Zerimba's conjecture, Zerimba conjecture would solve both problems. The numerical one, I agree, can be solved by other means. If you wanted to solve it with extremely efficient algorithms um, using this method, then you just need to be able to find, for any denominator, a numerator, with an absolute constant here instead of a constant that depends on b and d. Okay. And so a few years ago, what Jean and I proved the density version. So we took a equals 50, and then we could show 
that the proportion of d up to some increasing parameter n for which the conjecture holds tends to 1. Okay, so 100% of the integers do arise as denominators of fractions with partial quotients bounded by 50. And since then, my student, Xin Yi Huang, uh, based on some work of Ferlenkov and Khan, managed to whittle a down to 5. Today, you could probably get 4. Uh, and there's more recent work uh, on the rate uh, by Bergan and also uh, McGee O'Winter and uh, Bergan, myself, and McGee. OK, so that's Zaremba's conjecture. Bless you. Any questions? So it's some very elementary thing. I mean, I hope you agree Euclid could have understood the statement of this, this problem. And well, we have a density version, but we're very far from the full conjecture. OK, so that's Zaremba's problem. Uh, let's talk about arithmetic chaos. OK, so what's the classical arithmetic chaos? So this comes from a huge uh, industry of work. To what extent do periodic h orbits fill out g mod gamma, where g is some semi-simple group, gamma is a lattice in it, h, uh, you know, you look at some subgroup h, you look at closed orbits of h, and take them with some definition of length, or the area or something, going to infinity. To what extent do long periodic orbits fill out g? Or can these periodic orbits remain bounded if g mod gamma is non-compact? Can they not enter the cusps, for example? OK, so if h is unipotent, yeah, I'm really missing a, a chunk. On the computer, it's fine, but somehow on the projection, it's truncated. OK, so when the subgroup is generated by unipotence, this is exactly what Ratner's theory uh, answers. But um, even for split tor of higher rank, you again have these conjectures of Margulis and uh, older uh, work of Castle, Swinner, Dyer, that you again expect rigidity. So these should be um, algebraic. I don't want to get into uh, this whole, in th this plenty of people uh, have given lots of lectures here on all of these topics. So let me very quickly move away from it. What happens in rank one? Well, we know in rank one that these conjectures are false. So a geodesic, uh, you can have geodesics whose uh, orbit closures are fractal and um, doing whatever whatever you want, basically. But there's an interesting problem that somehow was overlooked uh, that Kurt asked. And it, it goes as follows. So again, you're interested in closed orbits of the geodesic flow, closed geodesics. Um, but you want to know, can they not enter the cusp in an in a arithmetic, algebraic way? So here's the, the problem. You look at the modular surface. Here it is, x. And you say, you ask, does there exist some compact subset? In other words, cut the cusp at some height. That leaves some compact subset y with the property that for any real quadratic field, k, you look at the closed geodesics on the modular surface, or rather it's a unit tangent bundle where the geodesic flow takes place. You want only those closed geodesics defined over this number field and that are low lying, that are contained in this compact set y. They don't visit the cusp. And among those, does that set have positive entropy? So I have to explain what all of this means. And instead of explaining what all of it means, let me first reformulate it in terms of classical, uh, a more classical sounding question. So here's the question. Does there exist some constant a, like 100, or 2, or 5, or something, so that for any real quadratic field k, you look at all the partial, all the continued fractions. now. Uh, periodic continued fractions, not finite continued fractions. Those will be in some quadratic number field, k. And I want to take all those with bounded partial quotients. So this is some set. The number of elements here is at most capital A to the L. L is the length. I want to know, does that, and I'm restricting to only those lying in Q adjoint root 5 or something. Does that have exponential growth? So the total number is A to the L. Does this have growth, some smaller constant to the L, as L goes to infinity? That's the conjecture. So let's, let me just state it using ones and twos in Q adjoint root 5, since it's still not known in that case. You take all ones and twos, <coughs> periodic, in Q adjoint, you only select those in Q adjoint root 5. First of all, is that an infinite set? That's not known. If it's an infinite set, does it grow exponentially? That's the conjecture. 
So why is this a what's the equivalence between these two statements? Why is this a reformulation of that? It's because the geodesic flow this is very well known as a coding of the continued fraction expansion of the visual point. <laughs> so let me explain what I mean by that. So here's the modular surface, here's a closed geodesic on it, and here's the universal cover. So I'll take some point in the universal cover. So this is a point and a vector, which corresponds to some point and vector on the modular uh, surface. It chosen so that it has a closed orbit under the geodesic flow. In the universal cover, that's just this infinite geodesic connecting two points. The visual point from here is just where do you hit infinity? And you hit infinity at this number. Again, it's getting cut off, but it's something root 5. And that has continued fraction 1, 2, 1, 3 repeated. Okay, And now we can see that it's 1, 2, 1, 3 repeated just by measuring when do we cross how often do we cross one of these lines before we cross another one? So let's see if I can catch it. So there's a 1, and this is a 1, 2, 3, and this is a 1, and this is a 1, 2, and this is another 1. So it's a little tricky, but the, the sequence, the cutting sequence of this geodesic flow reads off these continued fraction expansion numbers. So what does that mean? Uh, that's a better look at it. So what does that mean? Well, a closed geodesic is a periodic orbit, which means the cutting sequence is periodic, which means the continued fraction is periodic. So that's why you're always looking at quadratic irrationals for this problem. And now, so that's why we, and quadratic irrationals have periodic uh, continued fractions. What is this condition doing? So the positive entropy is the exponential growth. This is the restriction to uh, closed geodesics come naturally defined over some number field. And what is this condition doing? If you have if you want to go high in the cusp, that means you need lots and lots of you need to cross the same you see to go three in the cusp, we have to go left, left, left three times. So if you want to go high in the cusp, you need to go left, 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 left many times to come up to a certain height and come come back down. So having a restriction, what are, did I do something? No, I was trying to uh, zoom out. Oh, that would be great if you could. I thought I hit a button. This is definitely not an involution. Yes? OK, that's OK. I think we can sort of see what's. I'll, I'll read anything that's supposed to be on the page that isn't. Um, so the point is, having forcing the partial quotients to be small is equivalent to forcing the adjustics not to visit the cusp. So that's the reformulation. You don't visit the cusp. You give yourself some compact subset <laughs> y of the modular surface. You look at closed geodesics defined over a given number field, and you ask for positive entropy of that set. OK, so as I said, um, we cannot make very good progress on this. So in uh, Kurt's lecture, so here's this slide uh, where he made this conjecture. Does the number of periodic um, continued fractions in Q adjoin root 5, for example, with all partial quotients bounded by 2, for example, grow exponentially? And uh, the reason he said yes is because there are two. He found two. Uh, of them. The first has period 1, and the next one has period something like 17. Actually, he knew of, of two more of length 20. And um, so here's what we can do. We can, th there's about th 10 more that I didn't write down. But I think we have 13. Uh, that's, that's, that's it. Our, our, the progress that we've made is we've gone from two examples to 13 examples. This has period 44. So uh, you know I didn't do these numerics. Because uh, this is pretty impressive to, to go up to 2 to the 44. Um, they're done by uh, Laurent Bartoldi and Dylan Thurston based on, so I gave a, a lecture where I explained how I got a few more examples using the thin group's ideas. And uh, they managed to push it much farther. So now we know 13 of these numbers that lie in Q adjoin root 5. So now it's certainly exponential growth, right? <laughs> Out to length 44, we know 13 examples. Pretty sad. Okay. It's what's 
hard about this is we have lots of tools to control arithmetic. We have lots of tools to control the dynamics. But there's, no, there's little intersection of, of the two in this, in this sense. How do you, con you give me a bunch of ones and twos. What's the discriminant? Of the cor what's, what's the corresponding number field? It's very hard to have any control on that. OK, so that was the arithmetic chaos problem. Any questions before we move on to something completely unrelated? Yes. Exactly. So you have this Markov chain? The, well, that's, that's exactly, in fact, this question, this question didn't come from the Markov numbers, but the next question we're going to discuss is directly uh, came out of the study of Markov triples, yeah, which, which are the extremely low lying. I'm not asking for uh, this 3 halves uh, height, uh, which the Markov triples achieve. But just exactly, ones and twos, there is some bound. It's not quite three halves, because not every sequence of ones and twos comes from the Markov numbers. But yeah, that's going to be the next, the next slide. OK, so let me go to the next slide. Um, so this is the ELMV problem, Einsiedler, Linda Strauss, Michelle Venkatesh. So it starts out actually very similar. Is there a compact subset of the modular surface, or rather it's unit tangent bundle? So G is SL2R, gamma is SL2Z which contains infinitely many closed geodesics. Now it really sounds the same. Here's the, the difference, which are fundamental. So I have to explain to you what it means for a closed geodesic to be fundamental. So we know what closed geodesics look like. There's a correspondence, well-known correspondence, to binary quadratic forms with integer coefficients, or rather equivalence classes thereof, up to uh, changes of basis. And what's the equivalence? Um, well, so a binary quadratic form, as we all know, has discriminant b squared minus 4ac. I want to take the indefinite forms, which have positive discriminant. They have two roots, alpha and alpha bar, these two Galois conjugate roots. So all you do is you take alpha and alpha bar, and you connect it by a, closed, by a geodesic in the universal cover, fold mod SL2z, and that gives you a closed geodesic on the modular surface. And every closed geodesic on the modular surface comes this way. Okay, So that's the correspondence. And now we know what it means for a binary quadratic form to be fundamental. It's if it has fundamental discriminant, meaning this number d is the discriminant of a real quadratic field, which if you don't like that, it essentially means that d is square free. You can think of it that way. So the question is, can you find a compact subset of the modular surface which contains infinitely many of these very special fundamental closed geodesics? And that was the problem that uh, was asked of, of Peter, uh, and he suggested they look at Markov numbers. And the question becomes, how do you sieve on Markov triples? And the affine sieve is born. OK, so why did they ask this question? Let me just give a little bit of background uh, for the general audience. Uh, they were trying to give, and in fact did give, a new proof of Duke's theorem. So let me remind you what Duke's theorem is in this uh, indefinite case. So you collect, so let C, D be the class group. So you collect all uh, binary quadratic forms by discriminant. And by the way, this is a finite set, it's a theorem of Gauss. They were looking at higher rank. Different sets of rank. They were looking at higher rank, but then they came back and, it, yeah. That's right. OK. But they were looking at the higher rank situation. Eventually, they came back to do the rank one. That's right. OK, so this is the class number. And what you do, the idea is you look at geodesics not in a vacuum, but you group them by the discriminant. So every closed geodesic corresponds to some binary form, which has a discriminant. Group them by discriminant. So here's what this looks like. So let's look at this example. So here's a discriminant 1337, which is square free and hence fundamental. Uh, the class group here is 1. Uh, the narrow class number is 2, actually, but never mind. You, you won't see the difference when I plot the geodesics. So there's 1 binary quadratic form, which it can be represented by 19x squared minus 27xy minus 8y squared. So verify that that has discriminant 1337. It has these two roots, alpha and its Galois conjugate, which is negative b plus or minus root discriminant over 
2c. And if you work out the continued fraction of that number, you get this long thing. OK, so the class number is 1. Here is this 1 geodesic. So you see it has this giant 35. That 35 is what shoots you all the way up and down. It also has a big 17, and it comes up to 17, and it comes up to 8, and 5, and 8. And uh, there's a few 17s, so it does it forwards in, uh, in a few directions. But OK, so this is what this geodesic looks like in a vacuum, because when we grouped it by discriminant, there was only one thing to group. Let's do a, a more complicated example. So here's another discriminant, 1365. Again, it's square free. This time, the class number is 4, or 8, but never mind, 4. It has four representatives. And I've given you here their continued fraction. So one quadratic form, this is actually the unit in the group. Uh, the blue guy is, has continued fraction 135. I don't know what this is. Brown is 5 and 7. Red is 1s and 11. And orange looks like 1s and 2s. And here are those geodesics. So the 135 geodesic is this blue guy who just goes up to 35 and comes back down. That's all he's doing. Then there's uh, this red guy that goes up to 11 and then has all 1s. The brown guy goes up to 5 and goes up to 7. And then this uh, look orange looks like red, actually. So, so this guy is 1s and 2s. It's this very low-lying geodesic. So these are the ones we're interested in. We want to know, can we throw away all of these that visit the cusp, including this one that visits the cusp, and just keep these low-lying guys and find infinitely many? Even infinitely many is is not clear when you restrict to only fundamental discriminants. If you don't restrict to fundamental discriminants, you just pick the, the continued fraction first. And then whatever comes out, comes out. You have no control on the corresponding discriminant or square free part. But you don't care. You just There's your infinite sequence of low-lying guys. The question is, when you restrict to only the fundamental ones, can you still find infinitely many? OK, and why are they interested in this? Because Duke's theorem says, that if you group these geodesics by discriminant and you put uh, probability arc length uh, supported probability measure and average over the class group, in the limit, you get the same thing. So let's look at these two pictures. Let's pretend you were colorblind or that I didn't color these. These two pictures actually look rather similar. If you group, by, if you group all four of these, then that shading kind of looks like this shading. And both kind of look like dx dy over y squared. There's more stuff down here and less stuff up here. So that's what the theorem says, is if you group by the discriminant, you don't color, what you'll get is Haar measure in the limit as d goes to infinity. And so the question, if you want to try to prove this dynamically instead of uh, you know, Duke's theorem goes through um, half integral weight forms, their Fourier coefficients, bounds, uh, you know, Kuznetsov formula type uh, argument. So it's really um, analytic number theory gymnastics. But at the end, you're saying something dynamical. Maybe you could give a Ratner style proof of this. And the question becomes, well, what other possible weak star limits are there? The theorem is there aren't any others. There's only Haar measure. How do you prove that? Well, could there be other weak star limits without averaging? Now, of course, there can be uh, without averaging by just cooking up you know, individual closed geodesics, you can force to do whatever you want. Um, moreover, if the class number is 1, as happens infinitely often, I would love to know that, uh, then you just have this picture. So you have to have equidistribution, which means you have to visit the cusp. And so al among the discriminants which have class number 1, you can't have low-lying curves. Moreover, it's well, there's only one, oh. and that one has to equidistribute. Oh, okay. So with d going to infinity, you have to visit the cusp. The cusp has a finite proportion sure. of the mass. Moreover, it's much worse. It's believed that if you fix any epsilon and you range over only those discriminants, so the, the class number can be at most root d. And if you range over only discriminants with class number at most d to the half minus your fixed epsilon, individually, it's believed that every single geodesic without any averaging whatsoever does equidistribute. And if it equidistributes, then it visits the cusp. So it's not low-lying. So if you want to see any low-lying behavior, you have to use giant uh, class numbers. You have to have discriminants with giant class numbers. 
Okay. Uh, so what is known is that it's true with epsilon equal to a half minus one over ten thousand. So as long as the not only is it so if the class number is one, it's obvious by Duke's theorem that there is no low lying behavior. It's known that if the class number is at most d to the one over a thousand, then individual closed geodesics equity distribute. You don't need to average. And uh, under GRH, it's known that if um, that you can take d to the one quarter and still have that statement. And it's believed that there's no re natural reason for one quarter to be the boundary. It should be any power. OK, so in order to see any non-equidistribution, in order to have a chance of seeing low-lying behavior, we need to have giant class numbers, as large as possible. On the other hand, there's another very famous conjecture, which is that the average class number is 1. So if you sum the class numbers up to capital N, some parameter, you get, I'm being very crude, there are more precise conjectures, but it's n to the 1. And so we only want those discriminants with, discri with uh, class number of size root d. That means there are very, very few of them. That means the number of discriminants with, our, with the property that we want up to n is at most root n, roughly. OK, so there are n discriminants. We only want root n of them, which have giant class number. And among those with giant class number, well, most of them still equidistribute. And we want to find just those that don't equidistribute. OK, so here's the theorem with Sean. You give me a fixed constant C, positive. We'll produce a compact subset Y, depending on C, of the modular surface. So this is some height at which you cut off the cusp. And a set bold D of fundamental discriminants with the property that the number of discriminants in the set up to n is at least root n almost root n, n to the half minus the c that you gave me. So that's almost as, as sharp as you could hope for. And moreover, for every discriminant in this class, you look at the number of closed geodesics in the class group, which are, which are low lying, contained in this set y that's picked at the very beginning. The number of those that are low lying is at least d to the half minus 1 over a million, whatever your c was that you gave me. So that again is almost sharp. Uh, you know, the size of the class number is d to the half. And we're producing almost, it has, it can't, it can't be, um, it has to be at least some power less uh, than c. Otherwise, it would violate Duke's theorem. Um, so this, in, in two senses, is basically what, what you could hope for in the sense of producing um, fundamental discriminants. So obviously, so if you don't care about any of these uh, analytic estimates, the upshot is, yes, there are infinitely many low-lying closed geodesics. You take c to be 1 over 1,000 and just stop the game. But actually, it's, um, it's rather sharp. OK. So that's uh, the ELMV problem. Any questions on this before we move on? So again, you wanted to construct, you wanted to look at closed geodesics, which don't enter the cusp, but which are fundamental meaning the corresponding binary quadratic form has square-free discriminant. OK. So these two problems are rather similar. And um, I, think, I think of them as being orthogonal to each other in the following sense. They're both asking about low-lying closed geodesics. But I think of arithmetic chaos as vertical and ELMV as horizontal. So in the following, uh, here's what I mean by that. So here's my schematic of real quadratic fields ordered by discriminants. So here are discriminants going up. Here's my field k of discriminant d. And above k, there are infinitely many binary quadratic forms having discriminant, the discriminant of d times some square, but only a finite number of them have actually that discriminant. And the rest are the discriminant times a square. And so this is this finite class group. And arithmetic chaos is asking about you fix q adjoin root 5. And you look for a positive entropy of low-lying closed geodesics in that field, meaning larger and larger square-free parts attached to a fixed discriminant. But it should be uniform over all discriminants. But it's, it's fundamentally a vertical problem, as opposed to ELMV, where for each discriminant, you only have a finite number of chances to find low-lying guys. 
And you have to keep changing the discriminant as you move along and, and hope to find infinitely many this way. So hum, somehow the horizontal problem is easier in the sense that we can solve it, um, the vertical problem. There's a Pell equation that's hard to solve. And that's, that's what we um, are facing. OK. I think we talked about all the problems. I should just now tell you what the conjecture is that hopefully, well, it, it certainly implies all the problems, but the con we, we don't know how to solve the conjecture. Any questions before we go back to the conjecture? OK, so here's the local global conjecture. So far, we have not harmed any thin groups in this talk. So that's about to change. What is the thin orbit's perspective? So let me motivate the discussion with the following easy fact. If I have a quadratic irrational alpha, which is periodic, exactly periodic, then it's fixed by the matrix where I take each entry and I stick it into the, the each partial quotient, I stick into the 1, 1 entry. Okay, So this is completely elementary and classical. Here's another easy fact. Um, if I have a fraction b over d, I've put it into the unit interval, so the first partial quotient is 0. If its partial quotients are a1 through al, that happens if and only if this matrix, obtained in the same way, has its top row b and d. OK, so all the problems that we've discussed asked about bounded partial quotients. So I want to take all of these aj's bounded by some capital A, like 100. So what's the natural object that's underlying everything we've discussed? It's the semigroup generated by matrices of the form A110, where A ranges from 1 to capital A. And it's really important that, it's, that it be not the group. The group generated by this thing is all of SL2z. There's nothing interesting. Well, there's lots of interesting things about it. From this point of view, there's nothing interesting about SL2z. What's bizarre is that we have to take the semigroup. And for technical reasons, these all have determinant minus 1. So let me take even words so that I have semi-simples or risky closure. OK, so here's the object. The key object is even length words in matrices of this form where A runs from 1 to whatever your capital A is. And then what do you want to pick off? You want to pick off either the 1, 1 entry, or in this case, you want to pick off the trace of this matrix. Either trace squared minus 4 is the corresponding discriminant. So this object is thin. So I have to define what thin means. I especially have to define if thin means because you're probably used to thin groups. And this is not a group. So what do I mean by thin in the case of group? I'll give you the definition by example. So the Zariski closure of this set gamma A is all of SL2, as soon as capital A is bigger than 1. What do we know about the integer points in an Archimedean ball in SL2? This is classical, uh, that it's of size n squared. Obviously, we have much more precise asymptotics. So the number of points in SL2z in the integer points of the Zariski closure in an Archimedean ball is n squared. Let's compare that to what happens in gamma. This is an old theorem of uh, Doug Hensley's. The number of points in a ball of size n is not n squared. It's n to the twice delta a, where what's delta a? It's the Hausdorff dimension of the limiting Cantor set. So let me draw the picture. So here's the picture for a equals 2. So the Cantor set is the set of all not periodic or finite, just arbitrary sequences with partial quotients bounded by capital A. So here it is if A equals 2. Oops, I need to not touch this before it pushes more buttons. So if we look between 1 and a half, that's all the numbers whose first partial quotient is 1. Because we, we invert, we shift back by 1. Uh, all of these numbers, when you invert, lie between 2 and 1. The numbers from a half to a third have first partial quotient equal to 2. And everything else has first partial quotient that's bigger than 2, so it gets thrown out. So you think of the diameters as being uh, the intervals that are cut out. Then you look at the second partial quotient, and it's orientation reversing. So this is um, these are the numbers with second partial quotient 1, and these are the numbers with second partial quotient 2, and all of these numbers get cut out. And similarly, all of these and so on, and you continue in this way. And what's left is if you start in the upper half plane, and you fall, and you reach the ground, then you're in the Cantor set. Okay? So this is some representation of the Cantor set for a equals 2. And it has some Hausdorff dimension. And those Hausdorff dimensions for any finite a are strictly less than 1, which means this exponent is strictly less than 2, 
which means uh, as compared to the exponent, which is 2 for SL2z. And so that's what thin means. The definition of thin, a set of integer vectors is thin if it has zero density in the sense of your favorite norm ball, Archimedean norm ball, in the integer points of its Zariski closure. That's the definition. So that applies uh, to general sets, and it applies to semigroups. And if the object you started with was actually a group, then it's equivalent to the cl classical definition of a group. That's a simple lemma from Hal Moore and Dukrid and Sarnak that, that this is equivalent. OK, so that's what thin means. Thin is zero density in the integer points of the Zariski closure. So uh, here are some facts. So what about this, this particular Cantor set has been studied for 100 years, 80 years, I'd say. And uh, we know this number to 100 decimal places. Um, and what happens as a gets larger and larger? This thing approaches 1. And actually, we know the rate. So zeta of 2 makes a nice appearance here. We, we know more than, than this. I'm just writing the uh, initial, the first, the leading term. OK, so that's what we know about these Cantor sets. And that's what we know about the growth of this thin semigroup which was the key object. OK, that's the key object. What do we want to do with it? So here's the local global conjecture. What do we want to do with it? We want to take capital F, your favorite affine linear map, which is integral on, for example, SL2z. So if we're studying the Zaremba problem, then we want to take this map ABCD goes to A. That's an affine linear map, which is integral. Because A is picking off this denominator D. And what are you interested in? What's the image? Not on all of SL2z. That would be trivial. What is it on this semigroup? In other words, if you think of capital A as 2, then you're taking all matrices with 1s and 2s here. So this is 2 generated, or 4 if you take even words. And then you want to know, what are the 1, 1 entries? If every integer arises, then you've solved Zaremba's conjecture. So something can go wrong. And what can go wrong is there could be a local obstruction. So local obstruction means you're, tr you're trying to figure out when is an integer in this image. So if it's not in the image mod q for some integer q, then it's definitely not in the image. So that would be a local obstruction. And we call a number admissible if it passes all local obstructions. So for all integers q, it is in there mod q. Now that's the problem, because how do you figure out whether it's in there and what the mod q reduction is? Actually, it's not a problem at all. It's, Thanks to strong approximation, it's easy to verify uh, what this thing looks like. Let me not go into that in the interest of time. OK, if you look at a number of size capital N that's growing, capital N is some growing parameter that is admissible, what's the expected multiplicity? So there's another picture that you should keep in mind. So here's gamma A in a ball of size N. The number of points is roughly of size n to the two twice the dimension, n to the 2 delta. And what we're doing is we have this affine linear map, capital F. And because it's linear, these things are of size n. It's linear. So the image is also of size roughly n, let's say uh, minus 2n to 2n or something, just being crude. So you have these points. That's the image. What's the multiplicity? What's the size of the fiber? What's the expected size of this multiplicity? Well, unless there's some conspiracy, and we already know of one kind of conspiracy, a local obstruction. So let's say you pass all the local obstructions. How often should, should this number get hit? The number of images is of size n. The number of targets, the number of starting points is n to the 2 delta. So if there's no conspiracy, then the multiplicity, in other words, the number of matrices gamma in your semigroup in an Archimedean ball which the image under f is the integer little n that you're interested in, how often is that number hit? It should be of size n to the 2 delta is the total number of points divided by n. In other words, n to the 2 delta minus 1 divided by n because the map is linear, asymptotically. And let me be safe and give myself a little o. That's the local global conjecture. An admissible number is represented this many times. 
And the interesting thing is that 2 delta minus 1 in all of these examples, including a equals 2, because this is bigger than a half, 2 delta minus 1 is bigger than 0. And so if the multiplicity is n to a power that's bigger than 0, when n is sufficiently large, you expect to be there. So this is the local global conjecture in thin orbits. I just have one minute, so let me tell you the most recent. Uh, I want to show you a picture. So this was uh, Peter Cohen, my summer REU student at Rutgers last summer. I had him make a very precise conjecture based on not just the Archimedean, but also the local factors. And you can, you can work this out. Uh, there's, there's the conjecture, completely precise, in the Zaremba case. So this is this, uh, this map, A. And here's the picture. So this is the ratio of the actual multiplicity divided by the expected multiplicity. He went out to 100,000. And well, it kind of has a, it's, it's kind of slowly converging. I don't know if he should have blown this up so that it looks like <laughs> it looks better. But that's, uh, that's, that's what we know. Um, I'm out of time. Let me just give one sketch of, of, of a hint of what goes into uh, this ELMV problem. So what we really need to show is that trace squared minus 4 among these uh, in a ball are square free. That's what produces closed geodesics with fundamental discriminant. And you have to sieve. So you need a main term, which will come from uh, some product and expanders, expander graphs and thermodynamics. And you need an error term, which comes from bilinear forms techniques in this uh, group setting or orbit setting, setting. And we prove some average version of a Selberg one quarter or a monogen type, the analog of what a spectral gap would give, with some exponent, which is rather poor compared to what we would know in the arithmetic case, but nevertheless is strictly less than a half. So a half is a trivial bound. We have some numerical uh, bound. And that's um, it. Here are just some uh, references. So uh, there's a, a paper posted on my website that uh, has this discussion. And I'm out of time, so let me stop there.